the fact that she started this group around food, but such a specific nod to what it means to be Vietnamese in the present day and to be queer was huge for me. Hey, what's up, everybody? And welcome to another episode of the Accolades Conversation Series, in which I talk to some of my favorite artists about who or what they would recommend me checking out. Make sure to subscribe to our channel or hit the like button. Tao Nguyen, also known as Tao, is an American singer-songwriter originally from Virginia and now based in San Francisco. She is the former lead singer, songwriter, and figurehead of the defunct band Tao and the Get Down, Stay Down, and has collaborated with Jonah Newsom and Andrew Bird. Outside of the band, she has collaborated on projects with several artists such as Meryl Garbus, The Portland Shallow Project, and Mira. Her music is influenced by folk, country, and hip-hop. I spoke to Tao about Yep Tran, a chef, author, and longtime advocate for workers' rights in the restaurant industry. She is the founder of the Ban Chung Collective, an annual queer-centric celebration of the Lunar New Year. Most recently, she co-authored the Red Boat Fish Sauce Cookbook. She is currently the R&D chef for Red Boat Fish Sauce. If you are into my illustrations, please check out my illustration book, which you can still get on CrateRecords.be. This is what Tao had to add. I'm happy to call her my friend, but I, uh, I'm more of a fan of her work, but we do know each other socially because we've, we've collaborated a little bit. Um, but uh, her name is Diep Tran, but in Vietnamese it's Diep Tran. I first read of her work and what she's doing um, in a New York Times piece, in a New York Times food feature piece. And it was this thing she'd started called the the Ban Gin Collective. Culturally, and I was raised to really be a fan of food and I, in my adulthood, I have only become more a fan of, and student of food. It's like the most important part of, of my family life and how I interact with my Vietnamese heritage. So every year for Lunar New Year, there's a traditional <clears throat> sticky rice thing that you make. It's you soak the sweet rice and then there's uh, traditionally like mung bean paste and pork and it's marinated. It's a pretty involved process. You put it in a frame, You there's layers, you steam it for hours and hours. It's delicious. And then you give it as gifts. You know, like it's, it's one of the, my favorite parts of Lunar New Year is how you cook savory, items and desserts and then you can kind of go from house to house and everyone gifts each other these things that they make right so it's a super tr traditional food item and the making of it is a tradition that many families that my, i grew up with my mom making it my grandmother the thing with the bunkin collective where it found me was i was grappling with coming out in my professional life and within my family and for a long stretch of years it's been this internal struggle for me because of what i knew and what i didn't know of what my family's response would be for a long time i i thought if i were out i wouldn't be able to be a part of my family and a part of my culture so right so when i encountered this write-up of this this collective that Diep had started, where everybody gathers and they make this very traditional Vietnamese food, but outside the constructs of like a traditional Vietnamese family, so that there is this inclusive, very comfortable atmosphere outside of maybe really conservative, probably homophobic views. I, I didn't know it was possible. And so the, it, the fact that she started this group around food and, you know, such a specific nod to Vietnamese culture, but such a specific nod to what it means to be Vietnamese in the present day and to be queer and to still feel like you could be queer and be a part of your culture was huge for me. Because at that point, I thought I would, you know, you either choose one or the other. And I and I had led that life and it was a very bifurcated, divided life where I when I was not with my family, I was one way. When I was home with them, I was not myself, you know. Anyway, so I have so much appreciation for her. And from that, you know, I, I think I reached out and I just, I signed up for a course that was hosted in LA. The next year after that, um, she was conducting a tour where it would travel from city to city. And it was right before the pandemic. You know, it's like a queer, inclusive, not an exclusive event at all, but more like 
extremely open to people how, however they identify and you know sort of um centering women of color the things that i admire so much about deep are that i just love food and and people <laughs> provide it that uh i i wish that i'd been able to eat at her restaurant um it's called good girl dinette i think in la it was in highland park um, but it closed before I knew of her work. And now she is the R&D chef for Red Bull Fish Sauce, which is this ethically harvested fish sauce that is like um, such a mainstay of a lot of different kinds of cooking, but definitely Vietnamese cooking and Southeast Asian cuisine. Is it, yeah, is there, is there a big uh, Vietnamese population around where you live? I would say the biggest Vietnamese populations in the States are in Southern California. Mm -hmm. um, and then the where I grew up in Virginia, like right outside Washington, D.C. Yeah, there's a pretty healthy community there. There's actually a lot of people in and around Paris who settled right after the war in Australia. Vietnamese culture is pretty Christian, right? To me, it's divided between it's like very heavily Catholic and also Buddhist, and that's reflected in in my family's makeup as well. Like my and for me, for me being a complete dumb idiot when it comes to shit like that. Like Buddhist people, how do they act towards LGBTQ and stuff like that? Is that similar to you know Catholic or is that what I know of Buddhism is? It's more of like a cultural Buddhism. I was raised Buddhist, but not in the way that I I quite understood what was happening. You know, it was more like participating in the rituals and ceremonies that they bring you to. And then you're not necessarily sure what, you don't have the language for what's happening or not happening. And the tenets of Buddhism, I, you know, as I've studied it or experienced it as an adult through a Western lens, through English, yeah, no one should care. But the barriers, you know, the kind of constructs that are in place culturally take precedence over any tenets of the... So it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to do with religion, it's more of a cultural Vietnamese thing? Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it's like a deeply patriarchal, heteronormative thing, and, you know, and I think actually Catholicism has way more influence when it comes to... And is, is, that, is that getting better over the years, or is that, is that still a big problem? From what I know, it, it's getting more open-minded and expansive. I've only been to Vietnam once and it was only in 2015, you know. So from what I have heard in recent years, it does seem like there's way more freedom and open-mindedness than I understood there to be. Everything that I know of Vietnam goes through the filter of like all of my parents' generation. That's the whole generational gap that you kind of must but can't account for. But I have like my mom's youngest sister is the coolest one. And she's the one that told my mom, she's like, get like, relax. It's fine. Everyone's fine. So everything went better than you expected it to be. Like, is there your, <laughs> I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm yes. asking, I, I don't know, you know. Well, it did, but that's the thing about fear, right? That's the thing about silence. Mm -hmm. And it, it feeds itself and it perpetuates itself is so that you're not, you're no longer sure what you're even afraid of you just know you're afraid yeah but on the other on the other hand it's it's also like it can be justified if you if you actually know by a fact like mm -hmm. how somebody's going to react sometimes that reaction can be even worse yeah and it, you know it's like with and within families there are things that existed before that you you don't necessarily allow each other to evolve because you're too scared to talk about it right so i definitely i had been encouraged to not be out in at a certain point and then that just froze there. And if you don't talk about it or want to touch that, you don't know what people are capable of doing until you ask them to do something, you know? And eventually, you know, I did ask them to, but I just shared more about myself. So to come back to uh, who you named, I heard you spell it out, but I'm, I'm gonna have to look it up. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, totally, yeah. You, Cause you, you were talking about she writing books, right? With her partner, she's written a cookbook with red boat fish sauce to sort of expand the idea of what Vietnamese cuisine is, has been, and could be, and the way it's adapted through the diaspora, you know, because of how the Vietnamese community has had to find other places to resettle and, and how to adapt 
what I so respect about her perspective on food and culture is that it is this living thing and it can't be trapped and it won't be trapped by people who have no idea what it is, you know, to, for it to be named and conceived of by outsiders, you know, who can claim or dismiss how they choose, you know, and how that dominant narrative can impact how a dominant culture can impact a community beyond what we typically think of. You know, like, I there's this interview that she has with David Chang, who is a sort of like one of the celebrity chefs in that world. He has a podcast and he had her on as a guest. And they were talking about, you know, the idea of someone cooking pho, which is one of the main foods that Vietnamese culture is known for at this point the most popular iconic thing the issue of like someone else cooking that is it's not necessarily like they should be preternaturally good at it if they're going to do it they should excel but the point is the economics of that what you're doing is redirecting economic resources from the people who know this cuisine the best. The way she distills things down to the practical application of livelihood through this lens of food and culture. And she is such an advocate for raising wages for restaurant workers. I don't know where you exactly are based. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a good question. I don't either. Uh, I'm, okay. in the, I'm in the. I'm in the. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> in okay. The so, like, is there is there a lot of because there's a lot of fish and stuff like that in the Bay Area? Is there like is there is there a lot of uh, Vietnamese kitchen as well? Can you go to a nice restaurant there and eat Vietnamese food? Um, in the East Bay, yes. I think more in Los Angeles, more in Southern California. I go. I see my mom a lot. She lives on the East Coast, so I, I, I actually don't eat a lot of Vietnamese food out. I want to just have my mom's cooking. There's a fine balance between tradition and like finding new ways of of working with that tradition in that whole story. I think the balance is more around the narrative of like, are you going to allow for it to live and breathe the way you allow for other cuisines? You know. It's kind of like, what will, again, the idea of like, why would this group of people or this culture be stuck or trapped? You know, she just wrote it. I was just reading some of her writing around the idea of like, this Vietnamese cuisine is not trapped in a terrarium. It's to be expanded upon, you know, it, it can't be reduced. I want to thank Tao for this conversation. On next week's episode, I'm talking to John Robertson about ID4 wins. Thanks for listening, watching, or however you check out accolades. Give us a thumbs up or follow our channel. See you next week. <laughs>